Thanks everyone for coming to the University of Washington Graduate Program Application Workshop. So great to have you all here. I want you to know that we are recording this workshop for accessibility and educational purposes. It's gonna be posted on our YouTube channel later. And by attending this workshop, you consent to being recorded and acknowledge that this recording will be made available to the general public. If you have any questions, please just email us at gcgp at uw.edu. Before starting this workshop, we want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. At the GCGP, we consciously create safe spaces for our students, prospective students, faculty, staff, and community. So if at any time you feel anxious during this workshop, please feel free to turn off your camera, step away, and take a break. Also, if there's anything that I say or anyone else says during the workshop that concerns or offends you, please reach out to us so that we can address your concerns. And you can, again, you can email us at gcgp at uw.edu. So, who am I? <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Peg Chang. My pronouns are she, her, and I manage admissions and student services for the University of Washington GCGP. And joining me today are several wonderful guest speakers. So guest speakers, could you please introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, and your role at the GCGP? Uh, let's start off with Robin. Welcome everyone. I'm Robin Bennett. My pronouns are she, her, and I've been a genetic counselor at the University of Washington for almost 40 years, and I am the program director for the GCGP. Thanks, Robin. Why don't we go to Arielle? Hello, everyone. My name is Arielle. I'm a second year here at the UW program, and my pronouns are she, they. I will pass things to Ernesto. Welcome everyone. My name is Ernesto. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a second year uh, student here at the um, program. Thanks, Ernesto. And Clara? Oh, uh, can you all hear Clara? I can't hear Clara. Oh, shoot. Uh, well, it's oh, there you go. I was having Wi-Fi problems. I'm sorry. The Wi-Fi gods are not kind to me today. I'm Clara. I am also a second year student and I use she, her pronouns. Thanks, Clara. Okay. Thank you all guest speakers. Great to have you all here today. So what are we going to cover today? Today, we're going to talk about holistic admissions, which is what we practice here at the GCGP. We're going to talk about how to write your personal statement, how to write your short answer essays, what we want instead of a resume. Um, we're gonna give you some great tips for letters of recommendation. And then we'll go over how to apply. And then we'll also have time at the end for plenty of question and answers. So if, the, if you have questions about our program in general, just know that we have an info session about that. It's recorded, it's on our YouTube channel. Today's session is just about our application. Okay, let's talk about holistic admissions. Uh, well, actually, sorry, let me back that up. There are three major things that make us different than other genetic counseling programs. One, we have the cutest mascot out of all the GC graduate programs, and his name is Dubs. This is Dubs. Two, we are an accelerated master's program. So instead of the traditional 21 months that most master's degrees take, our students earn their degree in just 18 months. It's very fast and it's very rigorous. And then three, we have a holistic admissions process. So what does holistic mean? Holistic means we look at the whole person and all their unique experiences. And to do that, we look at the whole application. So our admissions process is attribute based rather than metric based. And the attributes that we look at are the following nine attributes. They are your desire to be a genetic counselor, 
your alignment with U the UW GCGP mission, vision, and values, your commitment to diversity, anti-racism, and equity, your adaptability and growth, your capacity for empathy, your proficiency in languages other than English, your self-motivation, self-reflection, and communication through writing. Those are the nine attributes we're looking at through our admissions process. So you're not screened by your GPA. So if you're used to being judged mainly by your grades and your GPA, that's not gonna happen at the GCGP. We do not use the GPA in our eligibility screening or in our initial review and scoring of applications. We also do not use the GRE. So please do not send us your GRE score. So if we don't focus on your GPA or your GRE score, then what do we focus on? We focus on the written parts of your application. We focus on your personal statement, your short answer essays, your relevant experiences table, uh, and your letters of recommendation. So let's now delve into each of those things. Here's Dubs again to talk about how the personal statement is a very important part of your application. Your personal statement is your opportunity to tell us your story. So as you reflect on your journey to genetic counseling, here are the three things we want you to respond to in your personal statement. They are, why do you want to pursue a career in genetic counseling? What steps have you taken to ensure that this profession is a good fit for you? And then third, what strengths do you possess that will help you be a successful genetic counselor? Now, that's a lot to cover in just a thousand words. So how do you begin? How do you even choose what to write about? So let's ask the people who've, who have done, who have actually done exactly that. Uh, let's turn to our guest speakers. And I just, I wanna ask them, what helped you write your personal statement? And how did you choose what to write about? Who wants to go first? I can try, can you hear me? I can hear you. So I get my phone. Uh, yeah, so for myself personally, um, I know that it took a lot of in a reflection, I think some of the biggest advice I generally received while applying for it is some of the worst mistakes you can make is falling into that trap of being like, I like genetics, I like counseling, I, that's why I want to do genetic counseling, which I think is true for a lot of people, but the issue is that it's not a dynamic essay. So for myself, I try to really dig deep into why do I want to career in healthcare. And that for myself personally, I started by speaking about personal experiences with my family with healthcare. And that tied in some aspects about my identity, as well as coming from a non-native English speaking home. And then from there, I talked about how some experiences and some interest in genetics made me realize that that was the career path I wanted and how I prepared myself. So I think a general good starting point is to really try to dig deep of why do you want a career in healthcare and what, is there a story there or is there something to kind of start it and then from there frame it from okay and how did you take that passion to use your experiences to be ready for this field to be able to feel prepared to enter the field. Great advice Clara. Yeah. Go deeper, go deeper into your personal story, could be your personal background, could be your family background and find, yeah, find, find that reason for why, why do you want to be in healthcare and why, why genetic counseling? Thank you for that, Cara. Ariel and Ernesto, would you like to talk about how you chose what to write about? Yeah, I can go next. Um, I think at the core, I to decide what to write about, I had to ask myself, um, similar to what Clara was saying, like why I wanted a career in healthcare, but I think also who am I and how is um, a career in healthcare also a part of me? Um, mm. I think I also so had to tie in a lot of like, the experiences that um, I had done and how that had shaped 
uh, myself as a whole and how that continued to push me along the same path um, in healthcare and ultimately towards genetic counseling. Um, so how each uh, experience continued to um, just reinforce that this was the correct path for me. Mm. Great tip to Ernesto. Yeah, to talk about your experiences and how they all led to you wanting to become a genetic counselor. Thank you for that. Ariel, did you have anything you'd like to add? For me, I think my answer is very similar to Ernesto and Clara, but for me, I focused a lot on what was the unifying factor between my experiences, my motivation and reason for pursuing these experiences that I have, and not necessarily looking at it from the lens of, oh, I had to do this to get into a genetic counseling program, but really deep digging deeper and thinking about where my passions in life were. And for me, that was stemming from my identity, who I am as a person, being from multiple different, um, having multiple languages in the in the home, multiple cultures. So, um, and sort of how that developed my personality and how that would lend well to being a genetic counselor. Great. Thank you, Ariel. Yeah. One thing that, yes, that you hit the nail on the head, something that stood out from all three of your essays was um, when I read them over before this workshop that I felt like I I knew a little, little bit more about you and I wanted to know more. And that's what makes us want to interview you, is that you give us that window into who you are um, and how genetic counseling fits into your life, like Ernesto, you were saying, and it makes us want to meet you. And that's key. Wouldn't you say so, Robin? What would you say is like key to the personal statement that makes us want to interview people? I... I resonate with what everyone has said in that uh, what makes you unique and what makes it so that I just can't wait to, to meet you. I want to know more about you. I can see you in our program and I, I just can't wait to hear more about you. Um, so, and, and to really, we don't need to know everything about your experience. You can put that more in the supplementary tables about your experience. Um, but who, who is it and what is that passion that you can't hide? Show, show that passion, let it shine. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everyone. So I want to talk a little bit about this saying, right from your scars, not from your wounds. Um, just want to put out there to please practice psychological safety when you're writing when you might be writing about potentially tough or triggering topics from your past. Um, if a specific topic causes you trauma, just thinking about writing about it, it, it might not be the topic to write about. Now, that said, the more personal you can be in your personal statement, the more you can have an impact on the admissions committee, but not all topics should be written about in the personal statement. Here's Dubs once again to tell us that your application also requires three short answer essays. So the personal statement is your opportunity to tell us your story and the short answer questions are your opportunity to um, expand upon your story in three different ways. We want to know more about you, why you're a good match for genetic counseling. We wanna know more about your attributes and let's go over each of the three questions. So I'm wondering, um, would one of the guest speakers like to read this question out loud for us? I can read them. Um, so it says, how will you contribute to or support the diversity of the genetic counseling profession? Should, should I keep going? Yeah, keep going. What <laughs> unique perspectives would you contribute to the genetic counseling profession? And how have you shown a commitment to diversity, anti-racism, and equity? Thanks, Ernesto. So I'm going to turn this question around to my guest speakers and to, to all of them, including Robin, which is, why is it important for us to know this? Why, what, do, what do you think 
what do you, th why is it that we're even asking you to write about this? I'll start, this is the core of our mission, vision, values. Um, we have a strong commitment throughout our program to this perspective. And as genetic health professionals, I think we have a duty to have this perspective as we're working with our clients from so many different perspectives. Um, and so to recognize our own biases and to continue our own growth in this area makes us better genetic counselors, makes us better health professionals. And so uh, this is a, a core value that we, we need and want to hear from you. Thanks, Robin. Anyone else have anything to add to that or how, how you approach that in your own application? Oh, Clara, I can't hear you. Oh, can anyone else hear Clara? I can't. Oh, Clara, I know you're saying something really fantastic because you always do, but I cannot hear you. Um, I, I can add, um, I think, um, it's, a, this is relevant because, um, uh, in the field of genetic counseling, um, you know, you're going to, going to be interacting with, um, people of all sorts of backgrounds and, um, you need to be able to offer your genetic counseling services to everyone and you, uh, should strive to offer uh, the same quality of care to everyone. Um, so ha having a commitment to uh, diversity, anti-racism and equity is uh, integral to um, the values of being a genetic counselor. Thank you, Ernesto. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So Let's move on to short answer question number two. In what ways is the UWGCGP a good fit for you personally and or professionally? So some of you folks have applied before with us, and this actually used to be part of our personal statement, but it's it's a pretty important, important thing that we want to know. And so we've actually taken it out of the personal statement, and now it's its own, it's its its own short answer question. We really want to know why you want to come here. And how is the UW GCGP a, a good fit or a good match for you? So remember, we're in an accelerated 18 month program, whereas other programs are, are generally 21 months. So are you ready for a very rigorous and fast paced program? If you are, please put that in this essay. We'd really like to hear that. Okay. Let's move on to question number three. Would one of my guest speakers yeah. like to read? Yes, Ariel. Can you comment on the last slide? Yeah, go ahead. I think um, sometimes I've I've read a lot of prospective students' ap applications, and I think sometimes people have a very broad or a very narrow view of what this means. I'd also like to encourage people to think about this more broadly, like more than just, you can even think about this more than just rotation sites, but even organizations that you want to work with in the Seattle area, um, specific specialties or programs. Um, UDEP has a very excellent um, HD um, program here. Um, there, in the, I know some people have done a rotation with a nonprofit, which is a little bit unusual. We also have a lab class that other programs don't have. So um, you can think about this question in a very broad way. And also like the, if you have family here, that support that you have um, going through such a rigorous academic program, it can mean a lot to have family or friends or your partner here as well. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks for thanks for giving some more tips on that. Yeah, please, please feel free to tell us about, you know, personal things that that make being in Seattle and being at the GCGP a good match for you. And take time to look through our website. There's a lot of things that Ariel mentioned 
that are on our website, that it's not just the fact that we have a broad spectrum of field work. We do hear that a lot, but is there something, is there something about the way our curriculum is set up, the way our program is set up, um, or something about Seattle and Washington that just really attracts you and makes you want to be here? We want to hear those things. Anyone else have anything to add about question number two? Okay, let's keep going. So question number three, would somebody like to read this one out loud? I can read it. I don't know if Clara's mic is working. So <laughs> genetic counselors work with people of all ages and backgrounds throughout all stages of life. As such, empathy is essential to genetic counseling. To effectively help others, one must be able to listen without judgment, see the world as the other person sees it, and understand and communicate the other person's feelings. Thank you, Ariel. So our third short answer question, it asks you to basically choose a scenario and then write about it. And so in each of the scenarios, uh, a person is experiencing a different life situation. So you're gonna choose one of those and you're gonna describe your understanding of what the person might be feeling. And if they were talking to you about it, how would you communicate your understanding to them? So we're actually just, we're gonna go through all of them, just so you know, uh, we wanna be transparent. These are all on our website too, but since you're here in the workshop, I want you to know like these are the scenarios. So Clara, is your is your sound working now? Um, I think so. Can you hear Yay! me better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I <laughs> took my headset from I took my headset from my cancer rotation and was like, oh, maybe this will work. Um, Excellent. Um, Can you read this scenario out loud for us? Oh yeah, sure. Um, a university graduate has just been offered a job far from home. They haven't accepted the job or told their parents about their offer. Their parents have always expected them to remain at home and help manage the family business. Their parents are also getting older and rely daily on their support of their child for help and support. Thank you. Oh, since your sound is working, I'm going to have you read the next one too. Next one is a 62 year old attorney is retiring at the end of the month. Her plan is to take an extended trip to visit her friends and family that she hasn't seen in years. Last week, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her town has one of the best, has one of the country's best cancer treatment centers, but her health insurance will change if she retires. So I think you all are getting the idea that these scenarios are challenging scenarios. Uh, Ernesto, would you like to read the next one? Yes. Uh, a young man is laid off from his job. A few months later, his live-in partner moves out and ends the relationship. He can't afford to pay the rent on his own, and he is rapidly running out of savings. Thank you, Ernesto. Tough situations. Ariel, would you like to read this one? A 58-year-old person has just learned their 25-year-old daughter is pregnant. Their daughter and the baby's father have been dating for a few months. He lives in a different city and already has two children, one of whom is less than a year old. The person knows their daughter always wanted to have children and they themselves assumed they'd be a grandparent someday. Thank you, Ariel. So these are tough scenarios that pe that these people might be talking to you about. So what are we trying to find out by asking this? And I wanna ask Robin, because I know this question is near and dear to her. Why, why are we asking people to write about one of these scenarios? What are we trying to find out, Robin? Empathy is a core skill of everything we do as genetic counselors. And this is really to get to, can you put yourself in these people's shoes and in, in these scenarios? Um, can you put your own judgments aside and be there for 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 whoever whatever scenario that you would like to write about. Exactly. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, we want to we want to know more about your ability to utilize empathy, your empathetic skills in writing about one of those scenarios. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to add about that before we move on to the next 
section. I, I actually Laura? did. I actually, I've, I've been talking to a friend about this and I actually had some opinions about this is that when they ask about empathy, a really big thing is also just show, don't tell. Um, where when you're talking about empathy, don't just say, and I would be empathetic to the patient <laughs> or I would be empathetic to them because that doesn't show that you have a good understanding of the word empathy and it doesn't show what you mean where when we need to think about what are actionable things that you can do either with word like phrasing or you know body language like what are things that you can sh say within that statement to show that you would show empathy to the person and kind of having more of that deeper thought and reflection to the specific scenario whichever scenario that you choose so I would say try to think of at least even if it's just one or two things something you could do to have you would show the empathy to the patient don't just say and I would be empathetic because empathy is important because Robin knows that empathy is important she wants to see your ability to understand how you can convey that to a person excellent tips exactly show don't tell Ariel? I also have some thoughts as well uh, one thing for me was I was really concerned about which one to choose but there really, there is no one right, true scenario to focus on. All of them are fine, equal. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I approached this question was thinking about the different, um, I suppose, thinking about even like social determinants of health that could be impacting these situations and also being sure to not use definitive language because we're making speculations about things that could be happening or someone could be feeling. So I tried to avoid any language that they must be feeling this way. I would phrase things like they could be feeling this way. So that's something mm -hmm. to consider as well. Excellent advice. Great tips. Hope you all are jotting this down because this is like Great advice for writing this essay. Okay. Oh, this is just to jog your memory, but we all covered that. <laughs> so just wanna put this out there to please take your time and ask for help while you're writing your essays. You can, you can ask a classmate who, whose writing is better than yours. I'm all for asking people who do things better than you for help. It's, it's, smart people do this all the time. You can ask your mentor or a trusted supervisor for help to read it over and see, does this sound like me? You could ask a trusted professor. You could ask a trusted academic advisor. There's lots of people that you could ask to get some help on your essays. Um, now here's, here's the thing. Some people might find it a little controversial, but one of my favorite writing teachers taught me, we must write as if we have no relatives. And I think it's a superb piece of advice. And here's why. Because to write as honest, honestly and authentically as we can, you write without thinking about what your relatives and loved ones will think of it. So Sometimes you can show it to a loved one and they, because they know you very well and they're actually really good at constructive feedback, they'll tell you if it doesn't sound like you, like this doesn't really sound like you. Um, put more of your personal stuff in there, put more of your personality in there. But there's also relatives and loved ones who will read it. And even though it is you being authentic, you being truthful will actually tell you that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like you. Are you sure you want to tell people that about yourself? And it causes applicants to doubt themselves, even though they're trying to be honest and truthful. So I just want to put out there to please avoid the temptation to try to get approval or validation from your loved ones by showing them your personal statement. Um, if they are people who can be constructive in their criticism, go ahead. But through my years of working with thousands of students, I have noticed that Many cannot be constructive when it comes to their loved ones. Please think about showing them your personal statement after, after you've finished it and after you're ready to turn it in. That's just my advice. Anyone else have any other tips? And it's okay if you disagree with me. That's all right. I would love to jump on that. Um, I will give some 
my my personal experience, I would I definitely agree with that. Um, but I would also add um, at the end of the day, make sure that your personal statement is showing who you are and you have to be unapologetic about who you are. Um, I know with these uh, personal statements, it's always, there's a lot of pressure that you want to say the right things to get in. But at the end of the day, you have to be happy with what you're writing um, and have that be a accurate representation of who you are. Um, my personal experience, I remember I showed my uh, personal statement to someone who I still respect very much. And the feedback that I got was not what I wanted to hear. Um, but I think I had to set that aside and tell myself, this is actually what I want to say. This is who I am. And this is what I'm going to submit, regardless mm -hmm. of the feedback. So just be proud of who you who you are on the page. I wanted to also say something to second time applicants or even more than that. Um, I, I was a second time applicant. I didn't get in the first time. And when you're looking at those statements, it uh, when I have looked at some statements, I don't even recognize that this is a second time applicant because their statement has so improved because they've done so many things. And it's fine to say that you're a reapplicant that that can be in your favor because it shows your commitment um, to wanting to be in this profession. So showing what you've done in the interim is really a good thing. So that's my tip for all of you reapplicants. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, all excellent tips. Really, yeah, show your real self, as Ernesto is saying. Um, don't don't be shamed at all for being a reapplicant, no matter how many times you've applied. We love knowing that you're a reapplicant, as Robin is saying. Please let us know that. Um, and yeah, you have to feel good about how you're portraying yourself in that in those essays. You know, be authentic. We want we want to know your authentic self. Okay, let's keep going. So another part, important part of our application is a section called the relevant experiences or coursework section. And we want this instead of a resume. So please do not send us a resume. Um, we want you to list out the experiences or courses that have influenced your decision to become a genetic counselor or have helped you prepare to enter the profession. So think about the transferable skills that you've gained through jobs, internships, volunteer experiences, shadowing, conferences, courses beyond the prerequisites. You do not need to put the prereqs in there. We already know there's a whole section on that. So don't put them in this section, but talk about briefly about those transferable skills when you list out those experiences and you can list up to a maximum of 10 of those. Okay. Um, guest speakers, a few of you, if could you just let me know, like what are some of the things that you listed just to give our our prospective students an idea of what are some of the things that you listed in this section? It's been a minute, um, but I <laughs> included um, an experience that I had as a health advocate. So I was helping people sign up for like Medicare, Medicaid, um, helping people uh, get like Section 8 vouchers for housing, um, looking for places to rent. It was really all these different um, things that contribute to making it hard to access health care. Um, and this was something that I did at a hospital. Um, so it's like almost setting the stage, getting that foundation for people to then be able to access health care services. Great example, Ariel. Anyone else remember some of the things that they listed, Clara? 
trying to remember. I think that <laughs> the similar vein of when Ariel was talking, it reminded me of myself. Of I think that I so I had a lot of experience with sexual assault and domestic violence survivors in a rural county of Ohio, serving as a patient advocate and hospital aide for them. So I know that throughout many of my applications, when I had the opportunity, I spoke about that, uh, just because it was something that I I was really passionate about, and it ties into a lot of passions that I talked about throughout various points of my application is that I care a lot about resources for underserved communities um, and that I think that it's one of those things of if you're passionate about something it shows and similarly um, I have a lot of passions about you know what the medical and legal rights are for survivors of those kinds of things and what we can be doing to be giving them better care and support following a time of crisis and I think if you're really passionate about something and it shows and then I think similar with Ariel's experience too is that you know they talked on it very briefly but it's one of those that if you get them talking they're very passionate about it if someone asks them about it in an interview like they'll talk more so something that you have passion about that has more unique perspectives I also know that I had done just several educational experiences to prepare me for genetic counseling school one of them was an educational in internship for the MCW that I know I talked about in some of my applications just because it really provided me an overview about different topics within genetic counseling. Um, I talked about informational interviews in some of my applications because in some cases I got to hear from some really unique perspectives from GCs and unique roles. So I think anything that you think is unique and prepared you, but also, again, just something you're passionate about that if someone asks you that you could talk a lot about it, I think is the best because ideally if you say something and they think it's interesting and they want to learn more and Robin or Peg mm -hmm. asks you about it in the interview, you have something to be like, oh, I love talking about this because it's something I really care about. So... Great Generally, point. Whatever your passion is. Great point, Clara. Yeah, I, you listed tons of great examples. And I, I've heard from many prospective students that they were told from um, other genetic counselors or other folks from other programs to not list anything that had nothing to do with science or genetic counseling. And that's not true for us. I just want to put that out there that we are very open to hearing about the relevant experiences that you've had that get, that have given you the transferable skills to do well in our program and have brought you to genetic counseling. So it does not have to be science oriented, does not have to be genetic counseling oriented. Just want to put that out there. Yeah, I would echo what you just said, Peg. Um, I remember one of the experiences that I talked about um, that really helped shape me was a um, internship where I uh, did an outreach project but was not really related to um, counseling or health care. It was for um, organizing art workshops for adults with developmental disabilities um, and that was something that I really enjoyed and I was um, still am very passionate about. Um, so as long as you are able to explain how that has continued to shape you and develop the skills that are necessary to be a successful genetic counselor, um, does not have to be uh, oriented in STEM. Thanks, Ernesto. Exactly. Okay. Let's talk about letters of rec. So if there is one thing, one thing that causes applicants to not have a complete application. It is their letters of rec or LORs, as I call them. So please, 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 please make sure you give your references plenty of time to write and turn in your letters of rec. We require three of them. And giving your recommenders three to four weeks is pretty standard. Um, I recommend giving them your resume, your personal statement, and anything else that you think they might need to write you a good letter and also spend some time talking to them about why you're even applying and why this is important to you to go to genetic counseling uh, school. So here's a pro tip. Give your recommenders a deadline that's earlier than the actual deadline. So our deadline, which is coming up in a later slide, is December 8th. Do not tell them the letter of rec is due <laughs> December 8th. Tell them something earlier. I recommend at least a couple of weeks. But since it's already, you know, early November, you could tell them the last day of November. That still gives you time, a buffer time to make sure that letter gets in. Now, 
if something happens, so let's say an emergency happens and your recommender gets in an accident or something and they wanted to write you a letter, but they couldn't get it in on time, please just email us immediately at gcgp at uw.edu and let us know and we will work with you and make sure that we can get that letter after the deadline if an emergency happens. But otherwise, you got to get those letters of rec in by December 8th. Okay. Um, another thing that you should know is that when you designate a recommender in the application, the individual is contacted immediately. So please don't enter your recommender's information until you've already contacted them and asked them if they're cool with writing you a letter. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask our guest speakers, who did you ask for a letter of rec? Um, what And what advice do you have for applicants when they're thinking about who they should ask and how? I had asked the head of my department, which was public health and health equity, but he was also coincidentally the genetics professor at my school. Um, I asked the doctor that I was working for and then also the supervisor for the health advocates program. Um, my advice is you can be, I think sometimes it can feel like you're not allowed to be directive with your letter of recommendation, but that's really not the case. And I think a lot of people do appreciate getting more information, like what is genetic counseling, what character traits would you like um, someone to emphasize? You can even um, talk through with whoever you're asking about like a specific scenario that you'd like them to mention that happened while this person was supervising you or teaching you um, that they can speak towards your character and who you are as a person. Great tips. I was going to say, um, I had, um, I used three people. One of them was the coincidence. He's the head of the biology department for my undergrad institution, but then he was also my research PI. Um, another one was a teacher that I took about, I think in total three of his classes. And then I was a, we use the word SI, but it's kind of like a TA for his class one semester. Um, and then the other one was my supervisor who was the head of my county for the support services for sexual assault and domestic violence survivors in that county of Ohio. Um, and I know in my case, I personally picked three people that I felt like knew me well enough that they could write a significant amount about my character for the sake for the in the case of my PI, I had been working in his lab for three years at that point um for the professor like i referenced i was in three of his classes and i ta'd for one of his classes and then for the i'd worked very closely with the head of my county for the um the services for survivors and i chose those three even though they didn't necessarily have a strong background in genetics because i felt like they could talk about my character and that they could talk about my personality which i felt like was more important i actually had a conundrum where i contemplated using some of my genetics professors because i had done very well in their courses and i was like oh well but they could, you know, it might be better to include them because they're genetics professors, but I ultimately decided against it because I said, well, you know, this plant professor, he's a plant professor, but he knows me so much better than these genetic professors do. Mm -hmm. These genetic professors can tell you I got good grades in their class, but you can also kind of just see that looking at my transcript. He, they, he, they, he, they really can't talk about my personality, but I felt like this plant professor could significantly more which is why I chose him. And then to the point that Ariel made, because I chose three people that didn't necessarily have the biggest background in genetics or counseling, I had sent them like, I made them little infographics about genetic. I was a little crazy about it. After I got <laughs> approval from all of them that they were all chill with being uh, 
supervisors for me, I like sent them infographic that I made that was like, what is genetic counseling? <laughs> and then I made a separate document about why I specifically wanted to do genetic counseling and what my passions were and what I was specifically interested in and kind of how it tied into some of my experiences. And then I also sent them my personal statement, which tied a lot of those experiences that I had that they were familiar with. Um, because I talked about some of those things, like I said, like my passion for working with survivors. Um, I referenced, I think my research in some of my personal statements, but in other ones I didn't, I think it kind of varied. Um, so I, because of that, I, I didn't necessarily give them very specific, like, I want you to write about this, but I said, like, I'm picking you because I know you know me and that I want you to write about me as a personality and me as a student or me as a, you know, researcher and that this is why I'm interested in this thing. Um, and then I just had faith in them. I also had definitely those issues with my UW application and my University of Pittsburgh application of them being my earliest deadlines and me having to bug my professors mm -hmm. about it. And I think that, you know, that's something that's very true of always be kind and be polite and understand that people have busy schedules. You should not be rude because they are doing a huge favor by writing you a lot of recommendation. But sometimes some people just need a little nudging and you need to remind them, especially if a deadline is approaching, because if it's a harsh deadline, it would be a really big bummer to ha to be discluded from the consideration of the applicant pool just because of a letter of rec not coming in in time. Right. Um, so right. definitely try to encourage them to get it done earlier as possible. But it's one of those as long as they get it done by the deadline. But thanks, yeah. Clara. Great tips. Excellent tips. Ernesto, did you have something you like to add? Last thing I would add is just make sure that you give them a proper thank you at the very end, because yes. especially if you're applying to like several schools and they have to like make some small adjustments for each application and it does still take time. So um, just make sure that you are um, giving them a very uh, genuine thank you and appreciation. Great. Excellent tip, Ernesto. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Okay. So we've gone over the whole application in general. Now let's talk about how to apply. So you're going to apply online. You're just going to go to genetic-counseling-masters.uw.edu. Click on admissions where you see that purple arrow. Take time. Oh, Take time to read through the admission site and everything linked to the admissions menu. There's many steps. Please, please don't rush. Take your time. And you will apply using the link that's at the bottom of this page. Just a few more tips. So I want to talk about fee waivers in case any of you would like to apply for one. If you're if you'd like a fee waiver for the genetic counseling match, so everything is through where uh, the match process. When you're an applicant, you will, when you, after you interview, you will turn in a list of who you want to be matched with, with, and then we will also turn in a list to the match service of all the people we interviewed and rank them as well. So if you need a fee waiver, you want to apply for that first, um, and then you register for the match after that. I know it doesn't sound super intuitive. The deadline is already over. It was October 4th, but I want to put this in here in case some of you are taking this workshop because you want to apply next year or in the following year. Just remember to apply for that in September if you need it. And then if you'd like a fee waiver for the actual University of Washington application, you can apply for that within the application. So as you're going through the application, when you get to the end, there'll be a section where you can actually click on a link to apply for a fee waiver. Save the date, everyone. The deadline to apply is December 8th by one minute before it strikes midnight on the West Coast. And we go by this, okay? So please do not turn in your application late. Give yourself plenty of time to look over everything. Check everything online. Make sure all three letters of rec are in there, okay? We are, we're using a new system at the UW right now, and it's a great system because it will send you reminders that you haven't turned in certain things, but it's really your responsibility to go in there and make sure that everything is in there by December 8th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific, okay? 
So that's where all the magic happens. Uh, Robin and I are beaming in to you from here where that purple arrow is. We're in that little brick building down by the water. Uh, just want to let you know that after you turn in your application, it's going to be evaluated by our admissions committee. And we usually choose between about 65 to 70 applicants to interview in February or March. Um, this is where we're located, but don't worry about coming here. To ensure equity, we do all of our interviews through Zoom. And as I mentioned before, we will turn in our rank order list to the National Matching Service by April 9th. You'll also turn in your list on the same, by that same day. And we all find out who matched on April 17th. And we really hope that you'll be one of the 18 students matched to the GCGP. To hear about all of our important deadlines and about upcoming events, please join our mailing list at, again, at genetic-counseling-masters.uw.edu. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you guest speakers for all your wonderful tips. We've now reached the time where you could post your questions in the chat uh, and we will answer them. All questions are welcome. If you don't have time to stay for the Q&A, you can always email us at gcgp at uw.edu and we will get back to you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Also, Peg, just so you're aware, yeah. someone asked about how long should the explanations be, and that was in re relevance, in re and that was in reference when we were talking about the part that's kind of like the expansion of your CV. And I was I couldn't remember the correct answer to that, so I didn't want to answer without certainty. But I thought maybe you or Robin would know better about how long those like sentence explanations should be about your other experiences. Yeah, Robin, do you want to answer that? Like how long? how long the relevant experiences descriptions should be? Yeah, this shouldn't be a whole nother essay. Um, <laughs> get, to the, get to the points uh, that this, um, uh, I learned skills of, um, of uh, for example, if you're working with, uh, as a resident advisor in a, in a dorm, um, just mentioned that, that, that that's what it was. That what kind of skills did you get from that? That helped for genetic counseling. So um, it doesn't have to be a long explanation. And in fact, we don't want to read a whole nother essay. It doesn't have to be long, but it has to be longer than just a few words. Because I yes. we've seen some where we're like, oh, they only gave us the title, like, you know, whatever it was, advocacy intern for blah 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 organization, and that was it. And <laughs> And I'm like, okay, that's that's a little too short. So I want to give you an example because I've met with quite a few prospective students who supported themselves through college by being um, by being servers or baristas. So they're in the food industry, and some of them they worked all four years. They put themselves through school. If that is a great thing that gives you transferable skills, you could put server at Outback Steakhouse for four years taught me time management, taught me how to deal with difficult customers, um, helped me form a strong work ethic, helped me um, un develop my emotional intelligence. You know, like you can put down a short description of how that experience helped you and will help you as a genetic counselor, okay? So many experiences do matter. Okay, glad we answered your question, Liza. Next question is, Let's see, in our response to the third short answer essay question, can we phrase our response like we are speaking to the person or should we be more broad in how we would show our understanding? Robin? I think absolutely, it's great to do it as the first person, like you're counseling that, that person because it shows that you're putting yourself in that person's shoes um, and, and uh, reflecting on your biases and, versus kind of this out, outside look in. So uh, you don't have to do it that way, but I encourage it. Anyone else have any other tips for that? Okay. Okay, hope we answered that for you, Nicole. Claire wants to know, for the language proficiency section, should we describe our proficiencies using the ILR levels that are linked in the application? Yes, we would prefer that. That's, we put that, put those links in there um, to give you some frame of reference 
So if you do use that as your as your frame of reference, it would it would help us. Good question. Okay, Jason wants to know, as a reapplicant, how much of our application from last year will be used in this year's application? For example, can I use the same people from last year's letters of rec in this year's? Do I need to write in all the essays and questions as if I'm introducing myself for the first time? Or can I reference my first application and expand upon the essay I submitted last year to share my growth from last year to this year? Robin, I'm gonna hand this to you. You should do this as a new application. That doesn't mean you can't use parts of it, but if you think of it, it didn't work last time for whatever reason, you might've gotten an interview, um, but if that, if you didn't get an interview, then, then you should think about what was in that application. You certainly can use the same letters of recommendation if you think those were good, solid recommendation letters. You know, if you, I, I, I don't think that that would be a problem, but we, we get a lot of applications. So we really don't, we, we do not, not really, we do not go back and look at your first application. We don't do that. Uh, so you you do need to do this like a new application, but again, use the parts that were the gems from the, the, the first application. Yeah, it's a good question. And um, thank you, Robin, for your response. I was also going yeah. to add, it's one of those of, you know, obviously Peg and Robin are very passionate and they care about all the applicants, but something to just remember is there are over 300 applicants that apply to this program every year. Um, even if you you did interview last year, it's one of those of there is a good chance that Peg and Robin and Brad are not going to Aunt Penny remember specific details about you from last year. So you should still, if there are very important details, you should make sure that you are including those in this year's applications because once they read it it may jog their memory but it's one of those of that it might be very hard for them to remember very specific details from applications last year because they read over 300 applications and that's true of almost any program you apply to most programs receive anywhere between 100 to 300 plus applications and it can be very tricky for the staff you know giving them that you know grace of it can be tricky to remember very specific details and i think that it's a very valid point when i've talked to people who have asked for advice with applications is that if you are re applicant really try to look back at your application to see what you can improve upon. Because if you're not changing anything or you're trying to keep a lot of it the same for the sake of convenience or streamlining, then the issue is, is that there was probably something that wasn't working last year and you need to try to identify what wasn't working last year and make modifications to try to improve it this year. Thanks, Clara. Like we're getting close to time here, so I was wondering yeah. if now would be good for me to talk about uh, the new group that we're forming. Yeah, actually, why don't you do that, Ariel, and then we'll answer um, one more question, and then we will wrap it up. Thank you yeah. for that reminder. So we are trying to launch a genetic counseling interest group for prospective students to come chat with current students or graduates on Discord. Um, and it's going to be a registered student organization at UW, but anyone, um, even people who aren't attending UW currently can still join the Discord server. So I will link that in the chat um, for people to join if you're interested and in just chatting to us more about the application process or what it's like being a student here. Thank you so much, Ariel. And thanks to everyone who's involved with that. It's such a, such a great resource for people. We really, really appreciate you doing this definitely sign up. Our, our, our students are some of the nicest, compassionate, supportive people around. Um, you couldn't ask for a better group to, to help you. Okay, one more question and then we're gonna wrap it up from Mana Sweeney. I, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. I hope I didn't butcher it too badly. This is a very informative session. If I talk about an experience in one of the short answer questions slash personal statement, but haven't listed it in my experience list, would it be considered as an inconsistency? No, it would not be considered an inconsistency. Like we understand that you have probably a lot more experiences that you cannot talk about, have room to talk about in your personal statement and in your short answer questions, but they'll be listed in your experience list. Now there will be some overlap for sure, but yeah, totally fine to do that. Thank you for that question. 
It just okay. a quick example, if it was, for example, you worked on a crisis text line, you might say that in your personal essay about how that how that helped you in your experience to be a gent counselor. But in if you want to put it in the um, in the list, you could say I had 150 hours um, and I was a supervisor or I whatever. So you could expand on it and not be du duplicative. Exactly. Exactly. Think about, that's a good point, Robin. So think about when you wrote your resume and you wrote those bullet points for your resume, think about using a few of those things to encapsulate that experience when you put it into our relevant experiences section. Yeah. Okay. You're very welcome. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. I wanna to thank all my guest speakers, Robin, Ariel, Ernesto, Clara, thank you so much for all your excellent perspectives and tips and advice. Um, I hope we've given you a lot to go on. And again, if you have any questions at all, there are no wrong questions. You can always email us at gcgp, I'm gonna put this in the chat, at uw.edu. Email us with your questions. We're happy to answer them. So good luck, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. Bye.